Okay, we are now recording. So that's taken care of. Um, another question, uh, questions to groups of 40 people are tough, but let, let's, uh, uh, are folks comfortable with us sharing the participants list um, so that you know who else was here and you can get in touch with the person in your breakout session? Okay, again, if you're not, uh, feel free to put that in the chat or to send me an email directly. Um, yeah, can, can we have a copy of the recording? Yes, so the uh, recording will be shared. Uh, I, we won't like, I don't know. Uh, we, we will make it. We will make it available to everybody who is here and to others uh, involved in ISO e call. Right. So. Okay. Uh, so we will share that participants list then. And um, let's see. I guess the other kind of ground rule thing, or, or you know, thing uh, 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 to be aware of is we are, you know, we are a larger larger, smaller group. We got 40 people here. Um, and so to accommodate questions and interactions and stuff, let's make use of that um, chat. And as we're going along, feel free to post your thoughts and your comments there. Um, and we have you know, five coordinators for the workshop, five leaders here. Um, and so you know, one of us will be presenting or leading a discussion or whatever at a given point in time. And the others will be monitoring that chat. And we'll try to address simple questions there on the fly, or we'll kind of cue those um, for discussion a little later on as we go. So post things there. We'll try to monitor that and follow along. OK. So uh, I think everybody has it at this point, but I'm gonna post the link to the schedule document, which is kind of your master stop, stepping off point um, for our activities uh, today. And so that's in the, that's just posted in the chat, the workshop schedule. Um, and on that document, if you're there, you'll find uh, you know, the information for the, the workshop leaders. Um, we'll introduce those folks in just a se second here as well as links to all of the other things that we're gonna be working with. Um, so uh, there's going to be some breakout groups and um, you'll find a link in there to the document where the prompts for those groups are and you know, where you can kind of, where we ask you to take notes so you can kind of follow along and synthesize that information. Uh, the R vignette and, and stuff like that is linked there now. So um, that's, that's where you wanna to go to find links, to find information. Um, let's introduce the folks uh, who are leading this. I guess, you know, I already introduced myself kind of. Um, I'm Gabe, University of Utah. I'm a stable isotope. Fill in the blank. Um, I guess I'm officially a geochemist, but I, I dapple in all kinds of other stuff. So uh, let's see. Hannah, would you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Hannah Vandersanden. Um, I was formerly a postdoc with Origin um, under Gabe Bowen and Mike Wonder. I'm now an assistant professor at the University of Florida and generally consider myself an animal ecologist um, interested in understanding migration um, with isotopes. Thank you, Andrea. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrea Contina. I'm also a former uh, postdoc with the Origin Group. So we had Mike Wonder and Gabe and Anna. And uh, so I'm a, um, Terrestrial ecologist, I'm interested in animal movements for the most part to study avian uh, migrations. And um, yeah, um, I'm currently with uh, USGS, uh, still a postdoc and very happy to be here. Sarah. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sarah. Um, I am a postdoc now at the Stazione Geologica um, uh, of Naples, not based in Naples, but in some other headquarter. And uh, I was a former postdoc uh, with Gabe at the University of Utah and also like the other uh, members of the origin group. I'm also, um, I am a marine ecologist, uh, also interested in using isotopes uh, to study migration. Um, and uh, when I was at Utah, uh, I sort of uh, worked on models to better understand isotopic variation uh, at different levels. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. And uh, yeah. last but not least, Mike. Yeah, I'm Mike Wonder. Um, I'm here in Colorado, uh, prof here. And uh, yeah, I've been working on this project and actually just doing isotope type things for quite a long time with Gabe and others. But I think at the core, I consider myself a wildlife biologist. Um, 
And so I, I much prefer to be, you know, in the field, handling animals, watching animals, that sort of thing. Don't we all? No, I mean, not all of us. It's okay. It's okay if you do. It's okay if you don't. Um, all right. So just a really quick lead into the structure for this workshop, what, we, what you can expect. So um, we're almost done with the introduction uh, of the introduction. Um, Mike's going to take it over in a minute here and kind of set the stage. So the focus for this workshop is on kind of optimizing project design. And so really what we're going to be focusing on is, you know, how do you, how do you develop you know, robust predictions for what isotope values you should be seeing in critters that are living in different places on the planet, right? Um, that's the, at the crux of these uh, uh, migration and, and movement applications that we're all involved with. Um, and in order to do that, we need data. Um, we need ways of working with that data, modeling the data. We're really gonna be focusing on, you know, getting that data, how we structure our projects to get the data that we need to, uh, to make those predictions. Um, and so Mike's gonna set the stage and kind of talk about many of the issues that come up um, as we're considering, considering that piece of our, our project, uh, project design. Uh, and then we're gonna spend a decent amount of time split out into breakout groups discussing. And the goal for those breakout groups is really to kind of share ideas and brainstorm and, and think broadly, step back and think broadly about different options that you have in your work uh, for designing that piece of your project for um, developing the data sets and the models that you need to represent isotopic variation in your study system, okay? And we'd like you to not just hone in on exactly if you're already doing a study or you've done a bunch of work in the past, not just to say, oh, I've always done it this way, but to step back and think about what are the different options that you have and you're not gonna, not every option is gonna be available in every, every system. You'll have some constraints on the sampling you can do, on the type of isotopic systems you could work with, it might be useful. Um, but we want you to kind of think about that and share and discuss um, because that's really at the crux of, of what we're talking about here. Um, we'll come back then after those breakout groups, have a you know, quick bio break, um, and then we'll uh, uh, have a little bit of a whole group discussion of some of the themes that come up. And, and one of the things we specifically want to do then is start to talk about, all right, how do we choose, right? How do we choose or select between the different options that we might have? Um, and then the final bit of the workshop will um, illustrate one set of tools that are, you know, that we've been developing that um, may be helpful in addressing some of these issues and, and doing some of that selection, right? Evaluating and choosing amongst different options that you have in your study design. Um, and uh, that's really meant to illustrate some concepts as well as introduce you to the tools. You know, it's not meant to be a, a cookbook necessarily. Uh, this is what you do to, to get to the end point, um, but uh, to make, make you aware of some of the, the options that are out there and that you might consider. Okay. Okay. So I think without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike uh, to do the next part. All right, thanks, Gabe. Yeah, so as I said, I'm a, a wildlife biologist by trade, and wildlife biologists like to have um, hold on. Wildlife biologists like like workshops, right? So we go to meetings and we have workshops, and I always remember um, attending these when I was a grad student and other times. So what I want to do first is talk about what this workshop is not going to be right, and, and what the workshop is really intended to do. So kind of scope out a little bit and just talk about workshops in particular. So, um, and it stems from my background in wildlife biology, but I always found myself sitting at some of these and wondering if I wasn't, you know, sort of caught in an infomercial of sorts. And so you can see right up here, these are actually, these are uh, fly rods, I, I'm a fisherman. And so I always got to thinking about this and this is definitely a cultural reference. So this has to do with a bit of, oh, good old Americana, I guess, or good bad Americana, old bad Americana, however you wanna call it. But um, for those who don't know, the banjo minnow is, is a miracle lure. Hold on, I think I need to do something here first. I didn't do this or this, so I'll do this. 
and then you've got to hear the intro from this. A great fishing guide. <laughs> I've been a fishing guide all my life, and I still love to fish and take people out and prove to them that every word I say about the Banjo 006 minnow is true. It is unlike any other fishing lure in existence today, and you will be amazed at how easy it is to create the lifelike movement of a real live minnow. Triggering genetic response is all in your hands. And it comes in this complete 110-piece fishing system, which includes the all-new Banjo 006 minnows in six spectacular colors and three different sizes. These new minnows feature holographic iridescent diamond flash foil that shines like a beacon to call fish from a distance. Also included are the new glow-in-the-dark firefly minnows for fishing at night, in the shadows, or in deep dark water. The only fishing lure that looks exactly like a real minnow now has swim cuts that allow anyone to make it swim exactly like a real minnow perfectly duplicating live-life movement. The all-new Banjo 006 Minnow is not just another fishing lure. It's different. The <laughs> All right. So uh, I put that up there because that's, honestly, I sometimes felt like that's what I was sitting through at some of these workshops, was sort of this little sales pitch for whatever the method was that somebody was doing at the time. And of course, if a person does that, they set themselves up for this. So you can do a search and just ask for, you know, what about that banjo minnow? Well, it's the best ever, worst ever, no? Old school, right? Let's test it versus another thing. Uh, let's take it to a challenge, right? Let's try using only that and nothing else, right? To do what it is that we're after, right? In this case, catching fish. Um, so yeah, kind of a cheesy intro, um, but yeah, the, uh, this workshop is not designed to do something like that, even though Gabe said that it's sort of emerged from a project that we're, you know, working on and that is grant supported and so on and so forth. That's, that's definitely not what we're going to do. Since I've been a prophet at CU Denver there, I've also um, initiated a course that's called workshop in biological sciences. And the, the crux of a workshop is that you have this back and forth and that there's a real dynamism there. So it's not really a mini lecture. It's not a not meant to be a sales pitch or anything like that, but it, it should instead be something that's um, very, very interactive. And so that's what we're trying to do. And that's why we've got so much time um, sort of set aside for discussion. And let me just try and see if I can't get this other tool up and going here, maybe. There, is that working? Okay, I see enough heads nodding. So yeah, we're gonna move away from this notion of like, you can think about this, right, as the, the, the sales pitch, as seen on TV, as read in the literature, you know, those sorts of things. World's first, we're the first to discover this. Yeah, it's a genetic response, all these sorts of things. So easy, even a kid can do it, right? Um, but uh, are you seeing my cursor when I'm, on there, okay, so you can see that. And then I can also, I think, draw on this little device. But if we look at this picture here real close, yeah, you think maybe that's a fishing net, um, but let's look just a little bit closer. And uh, hold on, no, not working. There, get rid of that thing. That pond that he's in is really a swim pool. Right, so that's chlorinated water. So it doesn't matter whether you've got the banjo minnow there and you're pitching it for the bass that you're interested in, you're probably not gonna catch them in that body of water. And so the point here is that it's much more important to know where and maybe also when to fish, right? Rather than about what to use. And so there's lots of other kind of cultural references here, right? If you give a person a fish, right, they'll eat for a day teach them to fish, they'll eat forever. Um, so lots of bad jokes that I'm trying to reference here. But the main thing that I'm doing is to try to get to a tool that works and uh, not draw all over like that kid in the pool, but that's all right, we're having fun. For these um, isotope based problems where we're trying to figure out how we can use geographically variable isotopes that are available to biological resources. 
um, to try and understand something about how those biological resources are moving around the globe, it's far more important to know where we are rather than to decide which tool to use um, to try and resolve these because the patterns that we're interested in, the environmental patterns that we're presented with, we don't have control over. They're governed by um, the, the features of the, of the globe really. And so uh, the first thing that we want to get you to think about in your breakout groups and as you're uh, working through your own project development or considerations or reviews, critiques, those sorts of things, is to think about um, the geography of interest. And so you can ask, how is it, how is it divided? So is your question really one where, you know, for example, you're, you're just interested to know whether or not something had uh, originated here, say in this part of the world versus this part of the world? Um, that would be sort of a situation where it doesn't really matter where within the continent it occurs, you just want to know if it's one versus the other, for example. Um, and that might contrast with a study that's really focused on a specific region and wants to know about locations within that region, right? So these are two different approaches, and these have been described in various uh, literature resources as uh, sort of nominal scaled or or discrete in this case, where you have chunks of geography versus something that's more uh, continuous in the sense that it's arbitrary within this domain where we're talking about. And you can think about it as, as being a, a really fine scaled grid that's approaching kind of continuity across the range. So that's first and foremost is to sort of partition out kind of what scale of geographical uh, resolution are we talking about? And then also, where are we, right? And the reason for asking about where we are on the globe has to do with the fact that what we're given, these patterns and isotope values are related to geography, but they're not related to geography in a one-to-one -one sense. So it's not the case that, um, you know, north to south, east to west is always meaningful. So the patterns can differentiate, uh, for example, over here, you, you might see some patterns in one of the isotope or one isotopes for one of the elements that sort of has this uh, north south type gradient. And that might be different from considering it another element that has sort of an east west type gradient. And so depending upon what you wanna know about sort of separating out uh, your samples, you might consider one versus the other, right? Um, there are also more complicated patterns that can emerge that really have little to do with that east, west, north, south uh, generality. And so understanding these things is important. So we want you to think about where you are and how that relates to uh, what the patterns of variation that you can expect are. And so think about yourself as sort of an experimental uh, biologist or an experimental person, right? One of the things that you want to do in order to create as much variability and pick up as strong an effect as you can in some response variable is to, you know, pick something that is a covariate or a cofactor that'll drive that difference, drive it to the extremes. And so for this reason, we want to consider what do we have to work with with various elements in our geographic location of interest. All right. And then the most important thing to consider after that, or at least one of the most useful um, things to consider after you consider where you're working is uh, how much experimental control you have over the generation of something, uh, you know, of these isoscapes that we're talking about. And by experimental control, I mean, can we go and sample uh, from across the full spatial domain? Can we sample from across the full isotopic domain? How do those things interplay? Um, so I'll try and get this back to there. Uh, yeah. So for example, this study right here, uh, yeah, this one shows these dots where sampling locations were. So this was for a, a set of, um, tree swallows. And it was fairly easy to, first off, control for just the species of interest. So it was just one species that this study was concerned with. And then this particular species has this characteristic of nesting in, in cavities. And so you can actually 
you can grow tree swallows by putting out a bunch of nest boxes. And so in that way, it was possible to set up nest box arrays across some spatial domain of interest and then attract birds in so that you could sample them. And when I say sample and what I'm talking about for samples in this case is samples that we can root down to specific geophysical features that are known and fixed. And so in this case, we would wanna try and generate some feathered tissue, for example, for the swallows from specific locations. And the way we might do that is, is to put out this nest box array and then go and sample those. And then we can look at the isotope values in their, in their feathers and interpolate or something. So, you know, uh, basically we have a fair amount of control in this sort of a setting, but you can see the spatial extent is huge. And so you've got to consider that spatial extent and then what does it return for you over here in terms of the um, range in isotope values? So these numbers on this gradient are the range in uh, hydrogen isotope values. And, and down here, they're the range in strontium isotope values. And so you wanna consider the range of variability that you have in the isotope space and the geographic space, and then the trade-offs that are associated with um, you know, maintaining control or trying to optimize uh, over one or the other. So this isn't limited. I, I put this up here. This is um, some work on, on sea turtles. I put this up to show that it's not just uh, um, terrestrial stuff and, and my tool isn't really working too well. That's all right. Keeps flashing back and forth. But this is um, another study that has sort of slightly less in a experimental control than the one that we just talked about. So in this case, there were a bunch of loggerhead turtles and, and these maps and these, this study was led by one of the participants here, uh, Simona Siriani, uh, as part of her PhD work. But here it was possible to put uh, satellite transmitters on these, on these turtles, these sea turtles, and then you let them go and then they go and sample the landscape. So you don't really have control over where specifically they ended up but you do have sort of some control over the organism that you're interested in and where they were presumably when they were growing the tissue that you're sampling to then kind of interpolate. So uh, one less level of experimental control. And then this one down here is uh, another isoscape in strontium values. And this is one that was created by all these dots represent the locations that created the, that provided the, the known origin material. And so it's fairly saturated spatially, you can see. And the way that that was accomplished is by just sort of throwing everything in there. So it's not specific to any one particular organism in this case, uh, for example. So you, you sort of have to give up some of that control over organism specific or tissue specific in exchange for getting, you know, sort of more spatial extent in the sampling. So um, finally, um, another approach that's fairly common is demonstrated by this figure here. And so this is a figure where we're considering a bunch of locations again across some geographic domain. And then these locations are not sampling uh, tissues specific to a target species, but again, just sort of throwing everything in there. And then in the background, what you see is an already created uh, gradient or isoscape um, that's created from uh, water resources, right? So these are just uh, biophysical resources. They're not created from the tissue that we're talking about having collected. And in that case, what we would do is to um, invoke some sort of a, a, a calibration study um, where you might take from these locations, you might take tissue that you knew was developed there and then relate it somehow to the model background, right? And, and show what that's like. Uh, and I just wanna bring up a few points with this. So there are choices about how you can partition things. And these plots are just showing that because this original data set was a composite of a bunch of different types of organisms, they were all birds actually, but there were different classes. So there were these long distance migrants, there were short distance migrants, and there were residents. And so one thing that you would consider here is where did they come from spatially? What is the coverage of the range that you're interested in trying to target for putting the, the pin on the map? And then how does the, the background 
range and variability here for isotopes, how does that get covered by the measures that you have in the tissue of interest? So on the y-axis here, this is the values of the tissues of interest. And on the x-axis is that background water isoscape. So you can see that you have varying degrees of covariate domain coverage here in the x-axis, depending upon which subset, how you subset the data. Right? So for example, for the residents, we're able to get some sort of a calibration from like minus 60 to minus 20. And so you can notice that this range for the entire geographic extent is much bigger than that. So anything outside of this calibration would be an extrapolation. So these are things to consider uh, you know, as well. And then the last sort of consideration that I wanna bring up is, is related to that. So we'll go back to the the single species model here and look at a study that was considering cranes and distributions of cranes across Asia. So those dots again are, are locations where um, birds were sampled and tissue was presumed to be of known origin. And then in the background here, what they've done is they've considered a range of different um, non-feather isoscapes, non-feather based isoscapes. So these are these happen to be for oxygen isotopes in precipitation, and there are three different models or three different ways in which you might model what you would expect for oxygen and precipitation. And then this last one is for what you might expect for oxygen and soil water. And then the same game happens. You, you make one of these uh, sort of calibrations associated with the background environmental isoscape to associate that background environmental isoscape to the tissues that you're interested in, in this case, crane feathers. And uh, so this is sort of a model selection kind of a thing, right? Where you're shopping around for what is the, not just across my geographic domain, what has interesting patterns and useful patterns of variability, but also how does that relate to um, the tissues that I'm interested in? And so things to notice here, are that uh, you know you've got this extent here in the uh, y direction is going to be the same for all these, right? Because those are the fe the feather measures; they're the same feathers in every case. And so what we're changing is really just the you know the slope here, and then the extent of the coverage that our samples have um, in the environmental domain. And those are important features because, you know, for example, this one here is, is quite short. So it's just running from minus eight-ish to minus 14 or so. Um, but if we look over here, this gradient for this here is running from something like minus 20 to, uh, what is it, oh, minus two. So we're really only sampling this small range in here, four to eight, right? when we're considering this set. But on the other hand, when you look at these calibration curves, you know, and you, and you notice that they're, they're on there, right? The, uh, yeah, these bounds. So I can fit a straight line through some of these, which would suggest, you know, no relationship whatever between the two. And it's still within the confidence bounds but it's harder to do uh, down here on this one. So again, you think about these sorts of trade-offs with respect to uh, coverage and, and completeness and calibration and so on. And this study concluded, in fact, that they thought that um, you know, this particular isoscape was the most useful for their purposes. And that might be because of this relationship down here between the environmental and the tissue isoscapes doesn't really allow for a no relationship kind of idea, but it does in, require some extrapolation and so on and so forth. What we don't know from this is whether or not this, for, for example, continues. And so, you know, is this a good relationship because of the spatial orientation of uh, the samples across that domain? Or is it because it's you know biologically somehow closer or something like that um, to the material that we're interested in? So what we're trying to do is to get you into a situation or a headspace that lets you think about these problems from first principles, 
right? So you're not wanting to go and pull the banjo minnow off the shelf and pitch it, but you're wanting to think a little bit about what am I targeting? What's the habitat like where they're there? What do they eat? What am I going to feed them? How can I, how can I mimic that? So you're moving from creating kind of a me too study to making a me one study, right? And moving toward first principles. And then finally, I'm gonna wrap this up really quickly. I think I'm probably a little bit over time, um, but there is the issue about building tissue isoscapes and that's not really what we're gonna be discussing uh, at length in this, this particular workshop. There's just simply not enough time. Um, but I do want to differentiate the structure, at least, for the model and the framework in abstract way for those isoscapes where you're making them directly from tissue of interest. So that would be the case where we were looking at the tree swallows and, and, the, uh, and, and the turtles and, and building directly just from those tissues. So in this case, you've got a level of data here where you've got your, these Y values are, are the um, isotopes. Right, so those are the isotopes. And then the X values here are gonna be your, um, your geophysical things, your geophysical um, covariates or cofactors. So this would include latitude and longitude. It might include other things that help govern variation in isotopes like elevation or depth or distance from some kind of isotope altering feature or whatever. Um, but in any case, these are things that are known, right, and, and are given, and are fixed and stationary, at least. And then this is the thing that we're wanting to model variability in, and we do that through some model that has parameters. And so this is just a random uh, vector notation for model parameters theta. And then there's, that's going to be your sort of deterministic prediction about what the average should be. And then there are parameters about how, how and, and how much. Um, values vary around that mean. And so that would be characterized by the sigma squared P for process. And then this is just an expression of what you might look at for the sort of the posterior probability on such a model, um, given your observations that you have for isotopes. And it's going to be proportionate to some statement like this, right? We're not going to get into the nitty gritty of any of this stuff at all, um, like I said, um, but we're wanting to just show you that these are all sort of features that are um, thought about and, and the reason why we need to consider uh, the components in the way that we're talking about trying to do that. And then the indirect is different in that we uh, have this cap xi or chi i, if you want to think of it that way, is, is really that's like an isoscape that's already created from something else. So it's something unrelated to the, you know, the isotopes that we're looking at in the tissues. So this case where we have an environmental isoscape that's made from these environmental or biogeophysical, bio mostly geophysical um, variables creates an isoscape. And then we combine those, that isoscape output, that model with the model that we have for our organism or our tissue of interest, and then push through everything from there as well. Um, so yeah, this is, um, these are things to consider. And then the walkthrough and the discussion is really meant to think about, you know, what it, we're going to focus mostly on this indirect component, assuming that it's really hard to do this well, to make an isoscape directly from tissue of interest well, because we don't often have control over where organisms are and where they're growing their tissue and things like that. So instead, what we want to do is try and leverage um, things that don't move around quite so much. And so this uh, workshop is intended to talk about trade-offs in the extent of information that we can put into this, these little XIs, right? So how much information do we have of known origin and what are the trade-offs associated with more or less information in, in those directions? And so, yeah, those are, those are set up. I think Gabe's coming back on here to say that those are set up as a series of prompts in a, in a document and then maybe talk about how to facilitate these breakout rooms. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks for the intro. So, you know, hopefully that gives you kind of a sense of some of the questions, um, you know, and the, the issues that, uh, that are going to come up in this discussion. And so, um, You'll find this link in the schedule document as well, but in the chat, I just posted the link to the um, breakout group prompts and notes. And so in a moment here, I'm gonna 
launch these breakout groups and everybody should see a pop-up that invites them to join a, a breakout session. And these are just gonna be small groups to kind of discuss and work through some of these issues. And so um, really quickly, here's the, the screen, what you'll see. Uh, you can use the TOC that you can find over here, or just scroll and find the breakout room that you're assigned to. And then uh, we'd ask just that you kind of take your notes here, you're able to edit this document. Um, and that way we can follow along and synthesize. But uh, the overarching question really is you know, within your group, discuss the systems that you're interested in, that you work with and uh, discuss the options that exist, try to think through the options that exist for producing predictive tissue isoscapes, you know, as Mike was talking about um, kind of in these study systems. Um, and the leading questions are here, basically kind of the four main points he went through thinking about the geography that's characteristic in your system and how you divide that up, um, where it is, thinking about the different isotopic systems that are potentially useful um, and uh, why, uh, thinking about the control that you have or don't have over sampling you know, tissues to describe, to, to, to quantify those isotopic patterns, uh, and then thinking about the merits or potential to develop isoscapes directly from that tissue data or to leverage other types of information like precipitation or soil samples or, uh, you know, marine algae or, or jellyfish or whatever else you have that might be more extensively sampled that you could use as kind of a template um, and envi environmental surrogate for building those isoscapes, okay? All right, we have 45 minutes scheduled for this. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule. So what we're gonna do is kind of monitor uh, these breakout groups as we go along. And um, if it seems like the discussion is fading off, we'll terminate it. You'll get a little uh, pop-up that uh, says you have a minute to kind of come back to the, the main room. Um, but we'll monitor, take as much you know, time as you need though, um, you know, and, and try to think through this uh, as we go. Uh, Gabe, do, should we answer any questions before sending people off? If there are any, uh, yeah, if there are any questions, for sure, let's let's do that. Are there any questions before we send people off to the breakout rooms? Uh, we will be assigning you momentarily. You'll get invited to a particular uh, room, and we're going to do it by random. So hopefully, you're in there with a, a person or two, three that you don't know, and. Uh, uh, we debated whether to put you, uh, you know, all the marine people together and the bird people together. And we thought this was better because uh, you'll, you'll get some different perspectives this way. Okay, have fun with it. Off we go. I think as co-hosts, you guys all got assigned to rooms also. Yeah. Um, Make sure that we're not all like mo multiple in one. Yeah, I'm going to move one person to room 10 to balance out. Yep. Okay, that's good. Uh, I, I know you guys are looking at the time, but I think we are over half an hour. Uh, behind schedule, um, something to consider. Uh, we're about 15 minutes 15 behind minutes, schedule. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Fabio, can you join your breakout room? Did you get an invitation? No. It's not showing up to me. Do you have a link? Uh, it should have just popped up in Zoom. Something didn't work here. Let me see if I can do anything about it. Should be for room seven. Seven? Yeah. Let me see if I can. And there's Jason back. Now with this setup, I don't seem to have the ability to force him into a room. Uh, 
I wonder, Fabio, if you can bring up the breakout at the bottom. Is there a breakout room icon that you pull up? Yeah, it, it, it shows me the option, but when I click on it, it just uh, highlights and disappears. The, the other option might be to leave and come back and then give the signs again. Yeah, let me see. <laughs> I can do that for sure. Would uh, one of you guys be willing to join room seven and just kind of uh, for sure, now just kind there. of fill that out? It looks like Hannah, you're assigned to it. So okay, I'll head there. Okay, thanks. Dave, I wonder if you could broadcast a message, or I guess I could too, that they can ask out. Right, they can ask for any of us to come in if they want. Right. Um, yeah, I don't remember how they do that, but. Uh, when they're in the breakout room, there's a little button that says ask for help. Uh, okay. It's all right. So far, nobody's written anything in the document, so. No, <laughs> it's typical. Yeah. Uh, I think it takes a while and there's probably discussion about what are we supposed to be doing and things like that that go on. Uh, it looks like one and two and then seven have facilitated. Okay, we're back. Let's uh, restart the recording um, and let's, let's just debrief. Thank you all for participating in that discussion. Um, uh, I know it takes a while to kind of get going, but I saw some interesting notes and concepts kind of coming up. Um, I think that's great. Uh, you know, that's something we can look back on and synthesize and, and uh, hopefully you got some, some interesting perspectives from the people that you're talking with and got to think a little more, a little differently about your own system. Um, just want to highlight a couple of things that came up, which were interesting. There's a lot here and, you know, I'll ask in a, in a few minutes here, if, if you anything you want to particularly discuss or again, put ideas in the chat if you, you wanna you can talk about something in the next few minutes here. But um, uh, just a couple of things uh, that, that I think were kind of provocative and, and illustrative that, that came up. Um, and so one is uh, the idea that in, in some systems we have a really good idea going into the study what spatial patterns to expect, right? What, what the spatial gradients and structure are gonna look like. And in others, we might not, right? We might not have a really great a priori expectation um, or, or one that's backed by data. And so how do we, um, how do we deal with that? Uh, you know, one, one possibility is we, you know, just try to go out and do some sampling with our organism uh, of interest to document the spatial patterns. And Mike showed us a great example of this in the, the lead in. So I'll go ahead and share screen one. You should see that now, right? So you saw this figure. And so this is a strontium isoscape that's based on sampling uh, some, some bird, right? Uh, across part of North America. And then using geostatistics, using interpolation to you know kind of connect the dots or fill in between the dots. Okay, and I think it's illustrative in a, in a couple of ways. One is you know there was opportunity in this study to to go out and get these samples, and so that's great. But they didn't come into it you know with a, a priori kind of expectation for what these patterns would look like. They just looked at the data they got and they they tried to put it together using statistics. Um, so what do you think about that uh, pattern that's mapped there? I don't know, does anybody work with strontium? Okay, this is, I mean, this is coming from the data. So in some ways it's, it's, it's good in that these are real samples of the organism of interest. 
they're placed on a map. We know where they came from. I think in this case, there's pretty good control over where those tissues were actually grown. And so it's good, authentic data, known origin data. Um, but when I look at it, you know, knowing something about strontium isotopes in the environment and kind of what controls them, um, I am pretty skeptical of that pattern. Uh, and so, you know, this, for example, is a strontium isotope map that we produced based on, you know, thousands and thousands of surface rock samples, right? Measurements of geological samples, many, many more than those bird samples. Um, and then using geological information to kind of inform the modeling and the mapping. Okay. And so, you know, if you're studying those birds from that paper, is this the right pattern to use? Is the other one the right pattern to use? All right, it's an open question, but I think what this points out is when we have limited capacity to sample, you know, our organism in the environment, um, we often have potential to uh, kind of miss details of these patterns, which may be important, right? Um, and so that's one of the main reasons really why so many studies have used, I guess what I would call it a surrogate or a proxy, right, as part of the method for developing the isoscapes um, and the tissue isoscapes. Um, in this case, we can go out and sample rocks. People have gone out and sampled rocks, right? Um, you know, many, or many orders of magnitude, larger sample numbers, and we have some a priori information on geological patterns that helps kind of inform the spatial modeling. Um, and so we can use this, you know, potentially as a template, as a baseline for what we might expect to see in an organism. Uh, and then we can try to relate that to the actual tissue samples that we have, right, um, using a uh, uh, what we might call a, a recalibration of the isoscape from the environmental material to the tissue. Now, is that perfect? No, there's assumptions inherent in that, right? There's assumptions that this proxy is somehow relevant and a good representation of the baseline spatial variability. And we can test that if we have our data, you know, in a simple way by looking at how strong the relationship is between the the baseline isoscape, the environmental isoscape, and the uh, the tissue data, but um, but you know it's 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 I think uh, you know since Mike showed it at the beginning, I think it's a nice example of why these kinds of hybrid approaches, where we can take something that we can sample a lot of, um, or know something for, about from first principles, and use it in our spatial modeling, is is helpful. Mike, do you want to follow up on that, or anybody else? I can offer something uh, briefly. Yeah, it's um, it's one of the reasons why you know I made the comment that creating an isoscape from the material of of interest originally can be really really difficult because you still have to have some sort of a link to geography and some sort of a you know process based explanation for why and how things might vary across that geographic space. And so the example with the tree swallows there, where the tissues were geographically distinct and of known origin, but then just sort of interpolated with no other explanation other than space, then that particular result, that result in isoscape, conflates sort of uh, spatial variance that's of interest with sampling variance that's just arisen because we're only looking at a finite number of samples from across that spatial domain. It's hard to do and it's tempting. It's tempting to just say, I, know, I don't know really about my region. I, there's not really much known there. Um, I, I know even less maybe about my target organisms. So let's go get a bunch of them and look at their, look at their tissue samples and, and see what we find, right? And so it's really just a heads up, I think, that Gabe's pointing out that if you can get down to first principles about something that is um, relevant across space that provides some sort of variance generating process across space, that's going to uh, return in spades. And so if you can grab one of those and then use your samples to, to as he said, recalibrate or uh, you know, relate them to what you would expect in your samples, oftentimes you get more bang for your buck, right? A bigger return there. 
Yeah, and so another extension of that, which came up in some of the discussions, I think, was you know, what if you have a baseline or proxy isoscape, right? And uh, and you're working in a system where there's maybe not much fractionation, or you think there's a somewhat predictable trophic fractionation. Um, can you just go from that baseline isoscape you have to estimates of the tissues for your study organism? And Sure, you can, right? I mean, you can you can make assumptions about that connection even without uh, the data uh, to back it up. Um, obviously, the the problem with that is you're stuck with an assumption that isn't, you know, you don't have data to test, right? Or you're not testing with data or or um, quantifying the relationship in a way that you can include that uncertainty. So you have to make assumptions about the uncertainty in that connection, that link between the isoscape you want and the isoscape you have. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's always a good idea if you can get known origin data, or if you have access to it, to at least use it in a way that you can start to quantify uh, the uncertainty in the relationships, right, between, you know, what you do have, what you've got, and what you're looking for. Okay. Let's see, um, I wanna look at the chat just quickly here. A couple questions have come up. Um, I won't address some of the stuff where we've already had some back and forth. Um, and uh, uh, Tara, since that's platform specific, let's come back to it. I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll maybe answer that later. <clears throat> uh, if you have longitudinal records from... Uh, so Geraldine, if I understand your question, um, can you can you maybe comment on what you mean by variability uh, in that case? Well, yeah, because he's commenting uh, on uh, what Dr. Wonder is commenting on on how using tissue might have variability when you're trying to retro like estimate your isoscapes. But if you have longitudinal records of animals that actually remain within, a, well, that are eating year round, of course, and not going through fasting, and uh, and are eating and recording that that ecosystem, and then migrating to another ecosystem, so you have like even the intermediate variability. Can you use that? Like, would that eliminate a bit of the variability he was discussing on, like the uncertainty on whether that tissue was integrated to that area or not? If you're just sampling like skin or feathers or 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 maybe blood, that that it's well, blood would probably give you like some hours of feeding. But just thinking about longitudinal records of tissue that might be useful to generate isoscapes. Yeah, I can respond to that a little bit. I think um, one of the things I'm always cautious about is that the goal is not to remove variability. The goal is to explain it. And so if we have some other factor that we can introduce into our modeling construct to help explain variability, as you are suggesting here, time, time locations, time covariates, that, that can be helpful. And it brings up another point that was sort of resonated. I, I heard it in a few different groups that I dropped into about the the problems that are um, associated with known or claiming something is known origin for organisms that move around a lot. So if an organism is moving continually while tissues are turning over and growing and so forth, it's essentially integrating away all that variability in space. And so the challenge is uh, to try and you know, overcome that in some way. And these all rest fundamentally on the idea that an animal is in a place long enough um, for it to come into dietary and isotopic kind of equilibrium so that it really reflects what's at that place. And it's integrating the variation just within that location rather than across locations. And, and that can be tricky. Um, I can just share a screen here real quick with one paper that we put forward that address this specifically. This is a complicated figure, but just the thing that should pop out is that in any of these dimensions, so here the x-axis is gonna be oxygen, here the x-axis is hydrogen, here it's carbon, and here it's nitrogen. And these values are values in um, bird feathers. 
um, from birds that were not able to fly when the feathers were being grown. So all feathers were dropped at the same time. They were stuck on this lake and they were eating whatever was in that lake to grow these feathers. And so the point here is that there are clearly sort of two groups of points or clusters. There's two clusters in every one of these scatter plots. And the explanation here is that although all these feathers that we measured were grown in this one single lake, um, there had to do with when the bird arrived and started using the resources at the lake. So in one case, these they were all tightly clustered had been there long enough that they were really just cycling through whatever was in the lake and then putting that into um, the feather development. Whereas these others, arrived at the lake right away, dropped the feathers and started growing. So it's a mixture, it's an integration of that spatial signal that we were just talking about. And so it's not the case where we wanna remove those or we wanna exclude this group or some such, but rather we wanna get some sort of a covariate that we can tag on to each individual that we're looking at to say, you know, was it of this early arriver or of this late arriver? And then how does that change the, the variation that we carry forward into the assignments, the spatial assignments? It's important to embrace and recognize your variability. The, the variability that you don't know about is what's going to kill you, right? Or give, <laughs> give you the wrong answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, any other things that folks wanna raise or, or touch on here before we move to the, the demo? Worked example. There's one more question in the chat there, Gabe, from Tara. Yeah, okay, so that's related to a signer specifically. So um, there were a couple questions about, you know, the, the, the program and, um, uh, one about whether it's going to do multiple, you know, provide capacity to integrate multiple isotope tracers, and um, that is about to be released. The current GitHub development version has a, a multi-isotope kind of uh, capacity, and so you know that's out there and available right now, and it will be, you know, in the the main release, we'll have it um, probably within the next month or so. We'll push that to CRAN. Um, and then the other one is incorporating other spatial information. And that's that's a great, great question and kind of a, a big one. Um, uh, I guess the short answer is there's no reason, you know, anything that could be modeled in a similar way to how the, the package currently handles um, isotope data, you know, could be analyzed along with the isotope data currently, right? Um, if, if the same kind of model form fits. And this is a little abstract because we haven't looked at the package yet, but. Um, uh, but yeah, in terms of other, supporting other types of markers, other types of information, you know, things like uh, directional information uh, you might have from, you know, tags or tracks or something like that. Um, uh, we, those are all possibilities in the future. I will say that we, we don't have specific plans for any, any one, but the point that I've made in the vignette uh, at the end of the vignette is it's an open source software package. And so our hope is really that folks will pick it up and use the parts that are useful to them and then identify things that need to be added on um, and, uh, and do that and you know, contribute that functionality back to the package. And so be excited to work with anybody on that or, um, or take contributions from people uh, in terms of new code and whatnot. So. Uh, Gabe, I just wanted to ask a very quick question. Um, just about um, the use and applicability of um, oxygen isotopes in marine and marine um, ice escapes, and it doesn't seem that it's something that's been very commonly used. And I just wondered if anyone could care. Maybe maybe this is a question for Sarah Magosi. Um, care to comment on that because I, I know I know people you know in paleoceanographic studies will use oxygen isotopes to um, infer. Um, you know, different water mass um, origin, and and it, and oxygen isotopes seem to be quite strongly driven by temperature um, and salinity. But I'm just wondering, is it is that because it's more useful with depth, and you don't really need ice ice escapes to be able to interpret the origin of where the organism is formed? I'm just I'm just curious about why there aren't really or there isn't much information on oxygen ice escapes in the marine system. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, this is not exactly uh, what I've been working on so far. So it's not exactly my area of expertise. So at the scale that I've been working, so far uh, hydrogen and oxygen are quite homogenous in seawater, whereas carbon and nitrogen are not. So you usually use uh, carbon and nitrogen also because they um, uh, transfer up to uh, food weight levels uh, up to the, the top of the food web. But uh, as you were saying, so there's strong um, uh, temperature dependency uh, of oxygen isotopes. Uh, and so uh, they've been associated with, um, so they've been used to um, interpret like uh, autholids, uh, as far as I'm aware, yeah. mm. a lot. Um, but other than that, uh... kind of two dimensions. So the otolith example is, um... I think more more a product of the the fractionation between the water and the carbonate in the otolith itself, and so it's telling you more about the, you know, the temperature at which the 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 organism, the fish was was living or growing its otolith. Um, the map I've thrown up here is you know just a a model again an isoscape model of um, surface water delta eighteen O, and part of the reason it's not been widely used is there's huge parts of the ocean where it's just not that variable. And if you go to the deep ocean, it's even you know, less variable than this. But uh, um, mm. the variability that does exist is driven by and really super, super tightly coupled with the hydrological cycle. And so um, fresh parts of the ocean uh, tend to have surface ocean, tend to have lower values. You can see river plumes and things, right? Uh, particularly at high latitudes where the fresh water that's running off has low isotope values. Um, you know, we see this. Uh, and then there's parts of the ocean where you know, evaporation is, is removing light isotopes and, and enriching yeah. the heavy isotopes. And so there are spatial patterns there. It's just that, you know, they're relatively subtle and um, except in areas like, you know, where you have river plumes, freshwater input and salinity yeah. gradients, which might drive habitat structure anyway. Um, you know, they're not, they don't tend to occur over short length scales. I have a colleague who was wanting to look at cuttlefish um, and um, look at the migration between um, Australia and New Zealand, but there's no there's no oxygen isotopic variability between those two areas at all. So I, I guess um, would carbon and nitrogen be just the carbon nitrogen and sulfur be the most useful tools for that? Well, yeah. Let's come back. Uh, maybe we can talk offline about specific systems. Yeah. But, uh, I yeah, couldn't yeah. tell you off the seat of my you know. Yeah. Let, let, let's have Thank a follow you. up. But yeah, Thank that, you. that's where you. Gonna have to dig, I think, to figure out what, what would be most likely to be useful. Thank you. Okay, uh, who wants to do a little little demo and look at some tools we might use to assess uh, some of these decisions? Okay, so let's do that now. Yes, please. Okay, so in the um, schedule for the workshop, I put a link to the full vignette um, we're just going to run some code from it, and I've also provided links to the actual, you know, code that I'm going to use here and demonstrate. Um, and so you can use either of those. I apologize if you're if you're not up to speed or not an R user. Um, hopefully, you can get something out of this, but we really, you know, just don't have time to kind of start from the ground up. And so, what I'm going to try to do is show you a few approaches. Um, I'll show you kind of how we can use them in this assigner package, but I, I also wanna emphasize just the concept, kind of the general, general thought process that we're gonna use here um, as we go along. And so we're gonna evaluate kind of two design decisions here, and we're gonna do them in a couple of different ways. Um, the first one is gonna be uh, a decision where we have a taxon of interest. We wanna to assign to origin. We wanna figure out something about its geographic origin uh, of unknown individuals, right? Um, but we want to evaluate the implications maybe of, of using known origin data from a, a different taxon that's related, okay? And in this case, we are going to be, we're going to have a little bit of known origin data from both species, and we want to kind of just examine and compare the implications of using the data from one species versus another, okay? And then the second one, we're going to, um, uh, compare hydrogen and oxygen isotopes um, for the same species and see, you know, whether using one or using the other is likely to give us kind of more information, more geographic information. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna run through this code as we go. Um, we're gonna do some setup here. We're gonna be using the assigner package um, and the basic kind of principle of assigner is that we take a proxy or surrogate ISO escape um, and we take some known origin data and we use that known origin data to create a calibrated tissue ISO escape. And so that's the first thing we're gonna do here. Um, Assignar has a database coupled with it or in it, distributed with it. Hydrogen and oxygen isotope data only right now, only for terrestrial, you know, subset of terrestrial organisms. So you can also bring in your own data from any source. Um, and there's information with the package documentation on how to do that. But in this case, we're gonna use some of the data that's, you know, distributed with the package for the examples. And so here we're just extracting data for this, particular uh, tax on the American yellow warbler. Um, and you can see that the data we get out, there's not a ton of them, right? But we've got data from, I think it's 13 sites or something like that. And there's 30 some odd individuals represented in this data set. Um, and you can see the spatial distribution here. And so one of the things that we should be thinking about already is, you know, is this an adequate distribution to kind of characterize an ice escape? And you know, if we don't have a proxy isoscape that represents the first principles, represents the details of the spatial variation, um, you know, this is obviously a pretty sparse data set. And so I would immediately be kind of concerned about just trying to interpolate these data, for example, um, to create an isoscape from the ground up. Um, but in this case, we have, you know, this is hydrogen isotope data that we're going to be working with first. Uh, and we have good precipitation ice escapes, um, which we can use as a baseline. And so we might compare the distribution of our samples with other geographic information, or geophysical information, as, as Mike was saying. Uh, so one would be, what's the distribution of the precipitation hydrogen isoscapes in our, you know, in a model, um, an isoscape model that we might use as a baseline? Um, and so you can see here, even though we don't have a whole lot of individual samples, uh, we actually, you know, have ones that span a pretty wide range of hydrogen isotope variation in the underlying kind of precipitation ice escape here. And so that might be encouraging, right? We don't have the entire range sampled, but we've got a lot of it sampled. Um, and then this is kind of a rough depiction of the breeding range, right? The range that we're interested in for this warbler. Um, and you can see that, you know, the samples that we do have span most of the hydrogen isotope range for precipitation within the breeding range. Um, and, you know, there are parts of the geographic range which aren't sampled, um, but a decent amount of it is. So this is all qualitative, right, at this point, but there are some things that we might look at and think about um, as we're starting to approach using a, a data set like this. And they might suggest, you know, if we want to do more sampling to get more known origin data, there's probably a reason why this part of Canada is not sampled. It's pretty hard to get to, but we might get a lot more bang for our buck if we could fill in the kind of this extreme end of the isotopic range and or parts of the geographic range that aren't sampled in the current data set. Okay. The next step is we're going to take these known origin data and the isoscape for precipitation. And we're gonna use a function in assigner to calibrate and rescale, right? Convert the precip isoscape into a tissue isoscape. And so we get some output here. We can see the relationship between the observed tissue values and the precipitation isoscape values here. It's noisy, but it's there, right? We see a linear relationship. And you can kind of look at any given band here. So these are gonna be individual samples from one site. And if you think about the plot that Mike um, just showed us for, for his birds from, from Utah, you know, we're seeing variability between individuals and that's characteristic, that's typical, or that's, that's to be expected. Um, and you know, what is this driven by? Is it driven by just differences in physiology or behavior of individuals? Is it you know, related to a carryover effect in the kind of, the, the nutrients um, or the, the elements within the individual's bodies, like Mike was suggesting, we don't know, but it's important to recognize that it's there. 
And so a signer is going to take the variability that we see there, and it's going to produce two things. It's going to use the relationship we just saw to make mean predictions. And this came up in the comments I saw also as a question. So we'll reiterate it here. So this is the mean value that we would estimate that we would expect for a tissue of this yellow warbler species, right? Grown at any place on this map, okay? That's what we would expect on average. This is the range or the standard deviation, right? The variability that we would expect at those sites. And it's composed of two things. One is the variability um, between individuals, right? Individual samples that we saw on that you know, calibration plot a few slides ago or a few plots ago. Um, and the other is the uncertainty in the isoscape that we're using, the precipitation isoscape itself. And so some of this spatial structure here reflects the fact that we have much better predictions for isotope values of precip some places than other places. Okay, and so those two things come together to give us a, a kind of composite uncertainty in the predictions for an individual kind of around this mean. Okay, so now we have a calibrated isoscape we can use. And so if we come back to our question, how much you know, does it matter if we use that species versus another species? Well, we have data in the database also for um, this species here, right? A congeneric taxon, um, which is, I think, the American red start. I'm not a bird person, but I believe that's right. So what if we pull that data out? Uh, look, the geographic distribution is pretty different, right? And there's actually fewer data for this species, okay? But let's evaluate. I mean, how different would the calibrated, right, rescaled tissue raster look? Okay. Well, if we look at the calibration function, Mike was, you know, prompting us to look at these ranges. And I won't go back to the previous one, but the range of isotope values sampled for this species, you know, because of its geographic distribution, the geogra geographic distribution of the samples that we were working with, you know, is very different. Uh, it's a weaker calibration relationship overall. Actually, the coefficients that we get here for the calibration are not very different, right? But, you know, here's the, the model that we get from that species. Um, and here's the uncertainty associated with that. Okay. So just using these data that exist, we can start to, you know, ask questions about how different um, these things are. And, uh, you know, we were looking at two different plots here, but now let's combine them. And so we're just going to look at the isotopic difference, hydrogen isotopic difference between the mean value we would predict if we use that one species to drive our model or the other species. And so we can see there's a kind of spatially structured, spatially coherent pattern of difference, right? If we use the actual species of interest, we're getting, uh, I guess, higher predictions up here. Um, no, lower predictions up here. If we use the surrogate species, right, the, the second species, we get higher predictions up here than if we use the actual species of interest, lower predictions down here. And so that will affect our assignments. Um, it will affect our analysis. How much? Well, the range here is not huge, right? Plus or minus five per mil or so for hydrogen. And so um, in one way, we can see that it's going to have an impact. Uh, in the other sense, we can look at this and we can start to get a sense for how big that impact might be, right? And so in comparison with the range, um, you know, which across this is uh, about 100 per mil, you know, we're looking at differences for the two species that are fairly small. And so maybe we could consider combining the two data sets, or if we can only get access to Red Start data, um, you know, for our future you know, work, then maybe that's maybe that's okay. Um, and so the the vignette, the full vignette, kind of walks you through a few other things we might think about here, um, interpreting that. But uh, but that's an approach we can take. Um, the next step that I would take here is okay. This is the the difference in the isoscapes we would generate using one species versus another, but um, how does that actually look in terms of the analysis we might do when we collect unknown origin individuals and we want to, you know, evaluate where they came from on the map? And I am a big proponent of using synthetic data for this kind of thing. So, you know, we have a template for interpreting data here, and 
even before we go out and we collect any unknown origin samples, we can start to ask questions about the implications of doing things one way versus another. And one way to do that is simply to make up some unknown specimens. And so I'm gonna pick two locations on this map and I'm gonna use a very, very simple representation of, you know, to try to generate synthetic bird tissue data. I'm gonna say that the values for the, the bird tissues are um, um, a function of the isotope values we've modeled, or sorry, the tissue values that we've modeled and some random variants on top of that. Um, we could do something more sophisticated here. We could make all, you know, we could come up with a, a physiological model or, or a more complex model that maybe more we think is more realistic that represents, you know, what if, or even not realistic, just represents a, a hypothesis. What if, you know, the birds are actually, you know, the, the, the bird isotope values are related to the precipitation in this different way, or, or what about this? So we can test ideas um, with this, but we'll just use it for this comparison between the two isoscapes we've generated at this point. Um, and so I've created here two data points right, unknown individual A and B, and these are the hydrogen isotope values for their feathers, um, which I've generated. Okay, and I know where they came from because I gave some coordinates here, and so we can play, play games with this now and experiment. Okay, it is now uh, the official end time for the workshop, and I want to be, uh, you know, conscious of the fact that some folks might have to leave now. I'm willing to stick around for another you know, 10, 10 to 15 minutes here to work through the rest of this example. Um, and I'll plan on doing that. But uh, if you do have to leave, um, feel free to, and just be aware that, you know, you can get to the full kind of vignette with all of these examples and descriptions and stuff, um, you know, from the, the workshop schedule document. Okay. I can't see everybody because the way my screen's shut up, set up now, but, uh, are, uh, are folks still game to keep going? Some folks gonna stick around and wanna do a little more? Yes, please. Okay, good. I've got a bunch of faces there now, great. Okay. So the idea here is we've just generated some samples um, and the next assigner function we're gonna use is called PD raster. And it takes our unknown samples and their isotope values. It takes our calibrated tissue isoscapes that we've generated and it's gonna generate maps that show the probability of origin, right? The posterior probability from the analysis that uh, a given individual came from any particular location on our map, okay? And so this is individual A, which had the higher isotope value. And you can see the probability density is, you know, kind of distributed preferentially through here. And so those are the areas that we would consider most likely um, to be the origin of this individual. Um, this is individual B, uh, which came from somewhere up here and you can see the difference between the two, right? And so that's kind of our first look at for any given sample, right? Given the properties of the calibration data that we have and the isoscapes that we have, what can we kind of expect? right, in terms of output from this analysis, in terms of the distribution of, of posterior probabilities, you know, for the, um, the origin of these samples. And so I've run that using the isoscape generated with our actual species of interest, but what if we ran it with the isoscape we generated using the other data, right, the data from the, the congener? Okay, well, that's, we get, something that looks pretty similar, right? It's kind of hard to compare these one-to-one, -one, um, just looking at them this way, but you see the same basic pattern across the two. Um, these are now, you know, stored as quantitative, you know, the data objects, data objects within R. And so we can do simple things like just calculate the difference between the two and look at those patterns, okay? And so here's our individual A, our individual B. Those are the actual locations from which we generated our synthetic data. Um, and what we're seeing here is the pattern of difference in the posterior probabilities for the two different, um, two, two different isoscapes. I don't have a scale here, right? That's not the point I wanna emphasize. We could look at the, the scale, but the point is that, um, you know, there are subtle differences in the result that we would get 
right? Which areas are considered most likely to be the origin of those samples using one versus the other. And then we can use that information to start to ask, you know, is that difference significant to us, right? Does it matter given, given the stakes of our problem, right? Given how we framed our problem, how much uncertainty we're really willing to accept, um, we now have a way that we can start to kind of look at and assess whether this will work for our particular project or not. So one additional step that many people like to take, you know, so far what we've looked at is probabilities. And the way we read these values is that any value on here, you know, we haven't masked for the known breeding range or anything like that. But, you know, if we're considering all of North America, any individual value here, you know, um, theoretically represents the probability that that individual came from the specific isoscape grid cell that we're looking at. And so somewhere up here, there's a grid cell that has a probability of whatever, seven e to the minus five. And down here, you know, we've got grid cells that, you know, are an order of magnitude less likely than that grid cell. Okay. And so we could compare individual grid cells. We could do various different things with this. But uh, one thing that people like to do is to carve up this space, this probability distribution across the map and summarize it in different ways. And so, you know, that's what I would call the process of actually doing an assignment here. And so we wanna take our individual, we wanna impose some criterion used on our probability surface. And we wanna say, where did that individual come from? You know, yes or no, it came from here, it didn't come from here. And so without going into the details, um, there's two different ways of kind of doing this in a SINAR, dividing the area up based on a, picking a fraction of the total area or based on um, picking a, a fraction of the total posterior probability. But what we've done here is we've just taken the top, the most likely 20%. So the 20% of the area, the study area that has the highest posterior probability values. Okay, and we've done that for um, A and for B, right? Sample A and sample B. And so you can see, you know, if, if we're interested in only taking the most likely 20% of the study area, this is what we get in terms of the pattern for those two. Okay. And we could also run our comparisons in this way, right? So we could uh, do the same thing with our other isoscape. And then we could make a plot, set of plots, you know, that shows and allows us to compare the two. And so this is if we use the species we're actually interested in to generate our isoscapes. And we do this process of dividing the map up and assigning our samples to, you know, the most likely 20% of the study area. Um, here's sample A, here's sample B, the true origins, and then the green and blue areas represent, you know, those assignment areas. And so again, you know, here, these are, are made up data. It's a made up problem. But the idea and the point here is we could take this approach and then we could start to kind of ask, you know, again, does it matter? And, you know, I would say for this particular example, and just the shallow depth that we've looked at it so far, um, it doesn't seem to be making a lot of difference whether you use the one data set or the other. Now, maybe depending on your problem, uh, the differences between these two are not acceptable, but um, there's not a huge difference in the assignment regions that we get for one versus the other. Okay. So that's kind of the, the first approach and the first um, you know, decision example um, that I wanted to kind of illustrate. We've got two options maybe for how we generate our known origin data. Um, and we can work through this process of just using the tools and examining the results. Um, including maybe some hypothetical or you know, simulated data uh, to get a sense for what we can expect the difference to be if we make choice A or we make choice B. And then based on that, we can come back to our problem and we can say, you know, is that problematic? Does it matter? So um, the second part here is going to be quicker. And um, just illustrate, uh, so the, the setup here, the, the idea is we have, you know, again, this um, yellow warbler. 
And we want to get a sense for um, which isotope system is going to give us the most bang for our buck. Okay, we've got these tissues, we run them on our TCEA, and it gives us both hydrogen and oxygen isotope data at the same time. We know that both exhibit spatial variability in the water cycle. And, you know, both could potentially be useful for geographic assignment work like this. And so uh, what's the implication of using one versus another? Uh, is one going to give us, you know, better output than the other, more precise information? Or does it have more information content in, in, our, in our geographic analysis? Um, and so we're going to be using a function uh, in a signer called QA, which we've written basically to allow you to um, kind of assess the quality of assignments that you get. Um, and so basically it does everything we've just done, except it automates it and it imposes a resampling on our known origin data set. So we pick some of the data, we go through this whole process of generating an isoscape, and then the data that we didn't pick are held back as validation data. They're treated as unknowns. We do this assignment process we just looked at. Um, and then we see whether the assignments get the known origins of those validation data correct or not. Okay. And then it generates a summary set of summary statistics. And so it does this iteratively. And so um, it takes a second to run because it's going to uh, um, kind of go through and do, you know, thousands of these analyses for us. Um, but what we get out then is uh, 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 a data object which contains you know, summary information, kind of summarizing in different ways how well the assignments worked. And we can plot that. And uh, there's four figures that are generated here. Um, I won't go through in detail. There's a little more description in the vignette, um, but we'll just look at a couple of them. Um, actually, let's just look at one of them in the interest of time. Okay, so remember we, when we did our assignment before, we carved up our study area into two areas, one which had high probability and one which had low probability to be the true origin of our sample, right? And we did that by saying, pick in the previous example, 20% of the study area, right? And give me the most likely 20% of the study area. What this is showing us is if we do that, uh, how many of our validation samples do we correctly place? How many are actually contained within that most likely 20% of the study area? And so what you can see here is for this particular example, if we take that 20% threshold, and we want to eliminate 80% of the study area and just retain the most likely 20% that we're going to get something like 60% accuracy, right? 60% of our samples are actually going to be from that 20% of the area that we've picked out as most likely, okay? And we can evaluate this at other, you know, so we can start to take this information and, and compare it with our question. So the the way I posed the question in the vignette, you know, the written vignette is, uh, let's say we're interested in comparing the US and Canada, and we want to be able to roughly exclude 50% of the area. So maybe that's what we're looking at. And so, you know, 50% uh, threshold, you know, we're actually doing really well. We've got, you know, above 90% accuracy in our, our validation sample um, assignment here. Now that's kind of a contrived example. Obviously we're not always gonna have the 50% excluded being one country versus the other country, but it kind of allows us to start to see um, how much resolution we can get uh, if we're willing to accept a given level of kind of uncertainty in our results. Okay. Um, we can also you know, do this then we can, oh, I didn't do that yet. Um, uh, we can also do this with oxygen isotope data. So now we're just going to pull the oxygen isotope values for these same birds, known origin birds, and we're going to repeat the process. And so this will give us the ability then to be able to compare between what we can expect in terms of the quality of our assignments if we use hydrogen versus if we use oxygen. And on the same plot here, you know, where we looked at that 50% criteria and that 50% threshold, 
Um, and we're getting above 90% accuracy in our classifications for hydrogen. We can see that for oxygen, we're going to be down around 70%. Okay. So we can go in and we can look at why that is. We can evaluate different possibilities, but it's a simple way of you know, taking these data and before we've even started our study, doing these kinds of comparisons um, to ask, uh, is this particular approach, this particular isotope system, we can do this with different sampling designs, um, you know, does this decision, how, how will this decision about how I go about this process, the study process, how is it likely to affect uh, the quality of the results or the um, specificity of the results that I get back? Okay. So um, that was super quick. Um, these things always take much longer than we anticipate going in. Um, it looks like questions have been posed in the chat and it looks like folks have been answering as we go along. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I will try to look through those if there's any that are remaining. I guess if there's any that are remaining um, that haven't been addressed, a question. We, we haven't have answered asked. Boris's question about including priors, for example, a known probability distribution. Uh, yes. So there is the capacity to include a prior in your analysis. Um, and so when you generate those posterior probability maps, the way that we've supported that is you can bring in an independent prior um, that's a spatial prior, right? So it would be, um, uh, if you have a map that indicates your prior expectation of the probability of different locations. Um, so from a uh, species distribution model or something like that, or, uh, uh, um, you know, field observations or, or whatever it is, uh, you can bring that in and that will be included in the analysis as a, a prior estimate of the, the probability of origin at, at different places on that map. Um, let's see, can you do an initial crop of the ice escape to the animal's range? Yes, you can. So you can include a I probably should have just gone ahead and done this here. You can include, uh, you know, how I plotted up the, the breeding range polygon. You can include any spatial polygon object like that as a mask on the analysis area. Um, and it'll automatically kind of crop and return results just for that, that area. So ideally, you would mask it before uh, you do the assignment. Uh, you can do it at various different steps. So you can certainly do it offline on your own. But when you run the PD raster function, um, sorry, uh, where is it? Yeah, here, right? You could include uh, mask equals uh, what did I call it up here? Pet range. Right. Uh, oh, there's no coordinate reference system for that. So, Andre, you didn't include a geographic projection information for the shape file? <laughs> it's okay. Um, yes. So, because you didn't give me the original. Oh, my fault. Okay. <laughs> So if you had uh, if you had a good valid spatial data object there, uh, you could include it as I've just done, and it would uh, return a, a masked result. I, I think the only thing that you I think you want to be mindful of, and that's what I was typing in the chat: the PP, the posterior probabilities will change depending on on the, the mask that you use, and because they all have to sum up to one. And Gabe, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you then um, Use uh you know restrict the the range that you're you are focusing on the the PP will also change. Yeah, so it has a direct implication in that way. Um, you know that's so it, it'll 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 matter if you have the wrong bounding polygon, you're not going to get any information on anything outside of that polygon. And so if your individual actually came from outside of there, then you're 
you know, uh, screwed for lack of a better term, right? So, um, so that's important to keep in mind. On the other hand, the assumption implicit in doing what I've done right here and not masking is that the individual could have come from anywhere in this area. And so that means that the, um, the proportionality won't be affected, but the actual kind of probability values that we calculate, um, you know, kind of implicitly, or I guess kind of explicitly assume that, uh, that all of these sites up here are po possibilities, even though they, you know, maybe aren't for our, our species of interest. Yeah, you can think of that masking as incorporating a particular kind of prior. And so everything outside the range is a prior probability of zero. Everything inside the range has an equal prior, prior, prior probability. So it's just uniform across that range. Okay. Anything else before we go? I uh, realize some of you are, it's very late for some of you. It's still very early for some of you. And many of us have been on Zoom for way too long at this point. So I appreciate you sticking with us through it. Um, I guess, you know, again, I would just emphasize, uh, use the links in there to go explore this some more and uh, do feel free to direct any questions. Um, you know, to us. Uh, there's a lot of documentation with the package if you do end up using it, but um, also just more generally, you know, hopefully some of the, the tools in, in the sign are, are useful to you, but, um, you know, if that's not the case, or even if that is the case, um, maybe more important than that is kind of the, the mindset set or the perspective of how we can, can approach some of these, you know, decisions that we make in setting up our studies um, using these, these kinds of approaches. So thank you everybody. Um, we'll see you tomorrow and uh, have a nice night or a nice day or whatever. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.